Hmm. because you still require the, that amino acid bolus to stimulate muscle protein synthesis. So you can stimulate it two ways, really, arguably. You can stimulate it through dietary protein hmm. and resistance exercise. So you can literally change your body composition just purely by adding, eating more protein. You can. You do have to control for calories, but you absolutely can, and I've seen it happen. Wow. Arguably, resistance exercise is even more important than diet when it comes to the literature, which right. I actually didn't want to believe. Hmm. But it really is important to, you know, challenge the muscle and stimulate it. You know, you can't get away from that. Right. So a lot of the information, the studies that have come out are epidemiological studies. So they're not randomized controlled trials. They're what we would consider low quality data. And when you think about epidemiological studies, you think about relative risk or risk ratio. And in order for something to be clinically significant, it has to be above two. Let me give you an example. Smoking and cancer, it has a relative risk of 12. They looked at all the study and all the literature of cancer and protein. Guess what the relative risk was? Probably a fraction. 1.1. Wow. So in order for it to be clinically significant, mm -hmm. the relative risk has to be above two. Got it. 1.1 is clinically insignificant. Got it. So it's like basically meaningless. Correct. So everyone will say meat is a carcinogen. The Annals of Internal Medicine, first of all, reviewed all of this. Annals of Internal Medicine is like the Super Bowl of literature. I mean, it's one of the most highly respected journals. Huge impact, impact yeah. factor. Um, exactly. They found no increased risk. Hmm. The committee that actually talked about protein and cancer risk turned out to be largely vegetarian. And they had a very strict criteria where they threw out all the high quality data. They limited a large amount of the randomized control trials and used low quality epidemiological data. It seems to me that there is a massive agenda problem. If IGF-1 was really a problem, then everyone in their 30s, when IGF-1 is their highest, arguably, or maybe late 20s, would have cancer. Hmm. But you never see that. It just doesn't make sense. It doesn't add up. Let's take a step back. So mTOR is mechanistic target of rapamycin. And people say that it's one of the pathways for growth promotion, which it is. Did you know that there's mTOR in every single tissue? And what if I told you it's sensitive to different macronutrients as well? Skeletal muscle is exquisitely sensitive to dietary protein. mTOR is also stimulated by other things like excess calories hmm. and excess insulin. Hmm which the liver and the pancreas are much more sensitive to. So if you're really concerned about mTOR and cancer, the worst thing that you could do is eat a high carbohydrate diet with excess calories. Arguably has nothing to do with protein and amino acids. That's like saying exercise is bad for you. 